Man, I'm so pumped for today's featured song. Named after a famous rock and roll legend, this is a blast from the past that came out of the blue and it took the world by storm. I mean, nobody was expecting it, but everybody started singing along to this song as soon as they heard it. It was written by a band who became the unintentional heroes to the underdog and was produced by a key member of the Cars. This geek rock classic it pays homage to every decade of, of the rock era, really. You're gonna feel great after hearing this one. Coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you have carefully curated the perfect mixtape in your past or in your future, you're gonna love this channel. Make sure that you subscribe below right now and uh, click the bell below the, the red button so that you get our latest interviews and our videos. So it's time for another edition of our series, Number One in Our Hearts. This is where we honor a song that was so amazing. It, it really deserved to be a number one hit on the Billboard Hot 100, but for myriad reasons, it came up short. Today we zero in on uh, a song, or really an album for that matter, that spoke for a generation. Back in May of 1994, Weezer frontman Rivers Cuomo was attending Santa Monica Community College in California. At the same time, his band had released their self-titled debut, affectionately called the Blue Album. Remembering what should have been uh, the ultimate bragging moment, Rivers said that he, he brought the album to class, you know, to show it off. But everyone there was like, yeah, cool, whatever. It wasn't exactly the enthusiastic response that he was looking for. But even though Cuomo's uh, classmates may not have been really overly impressed, the rest of the music world was about to go crazy over it. In the early days of Weezer, the band members resisted the label of nerd rock. This, even though the Blue Album may just be the, the subgenre's ultimate example. When you think of Weezer during this period, uh, images of unraveling sweaters, Dungeons and Dragons, comic books, hacky sacks, and you know, thick-rimmed glasses all come to mind. And it was this unapologetic nerdiness that, that really captivated the 90s MTV generation. Consisting of Rivers Cuomo on lead vocals and guitar, uh, there's Matt Sharp on bass, Patrick Wilson on drums, and Jason Cropper on guitar. The four original bandmates formed on Valentine's Day of 1992, and from 92 to 93, Weezer played in clubs around LA and along the California coast. Initially, it was a struggle to get record labels interested in them, but eventually they signed with Geffen Records in June of 93. Geffen was always in the middle of it back then. Uh, after securing a major label deal, Weezer fully intended to produce themselves, but Geffen really pushed them to work with a producer. So Rivers figured if they had to have somebody, might as well be one of his heroes. His first choice was the Cars Rick Ocasek. This is a person he admired for both his, his songwriting and his production skills. The band all agreed and they sent Rick a demo. Okasik flipped out when he heard this tape. Uh, I guess he was driving at the time and he couldn't believe the, what he was hearing. He absolutely loved it. Rick tried to imagine what these guys looked like, you know, but he couldn't figure it out. Were they metalheads? Their guitar work on the demo was super heavy, but at the same time, the melody sounded nothing like metal. He didn't know what to think. A couple days later, Geffen called Weezer to give them a heads up that Rick was going to stop by the rehearsal space. Said Matt Sharp about it. We were just like, yeah, right. But that day, Pat saw him in a guitar store. And he goes, maybe he is coming. The bandmates were, were super nervous. They really wanted to impress Okasik. So in a bid to pay homage to their potential producer, uh, Weezer worked up a cover of the car's 1978 smash single, Just What I Needed. So when Rick walked into the rehearsal, the guys were in the middle of this song. And when they saw him, they just froze. Well, Kasich told him, you know, not to stop. Just pretend I'm not here. And then he just sat down on the floor and he pulled out some paper and he just started sketching. I just like to draw, he said. So I'm gonna draw over here. The guys were like, okay, what do we do now? 
But then Rivers gave everyone the look, and in unison, they burst into just what I needed. After hearing it, Okasik said he thought it, it was pretty cute. It was a good first impression. And as for the rest of the rehearsal, he loved that too. Weezer ha had a powerful sound, and he wanted this job. Afterwards, Rick invited the band to fly out to New York and record the album there. The guys obliged, and they were soon on their way. Setting up shop at SIR Studios for rehearsals and then Electric Lady Studios to record. Recording got underway in uh, late August of 1993. However, by the first week of September, guitarist Jason Cropper was asked to leave, not to leave the band. The reasons have never been fully revealed. Cropper signed a strict non-disclosure agreement. Uh, if he ever shares the details, he would, of course, be in breach of contract. What he would say was that he had nothing but the fondest of memories of his time in Weezer and that he didn't have anything disparaging to say about the band or the members. But with Jason gone, you know, Weezer needed a replacement and they needed it fast. Mixing was just two days away at that point. So the guys called up an L.A. friend, Brian Bell. They sent him a tape. Bell sent a tape back showing that he could play the songs and, you know, he ultimately pass the audition. Now, since time was short, Rivers re-recorded Jason's backing vocals and his guitar parts himself. Cassick well, told Rivers just to keep the old tracks, but Cuomo, ever the perfectionist, he was insistent. He then proceeded to knock out all of Cropper's parts in a one-day marathon session. When the recording was finished, what Weezer had uh, was a nearly flawless 10-track album, you know, with, with more geek rock glory than any of us deserved. No one hears me sing this song. The Blue Album is a post-grunge alternative masterpiece, overflowing with, you know, Beach Boyish harmonies, bubblicious pop hooks, and a crunchy distortion. 90s nerd rock that's never been equal. Out of the record's 10 tracks, I would argue that really nine of them could have been singles. The only reason it's not 10 is because the closing track, Only in Dreams, is eight minutes long, and that wouldn't have worked. As it were, Weezer released three singles from the album, Undone the Sweater Song, Say It Ain't So, and today's feature, Buddy Holly. Don't worry, we're going to cover them all. This is a perfect album. According to former bandmate Jason Cropper, Buddy Holly was a post-record deal song. In a sense, it was a celebration of Weezer getting signed. He said as soon as they were signed by Geffen, it was made known that Weezer had to step up their game. Rivers took the challenge to heart, and this next level gem was really the result of that. Buddy Holly was Cuomo bringing his A game to Geffen. In its early stages, Buddy Holly actually had nothing to do with Buddy Holly. Initially, the song name-checked a couple of silver screen icons instead. Ooh, you, you look just like Ginger Rogers. Oh, oh, I move just like Fred Astaire. For those unfamiliar, Ginger Rogers was an American actress, singer, and dancer during the golden age of Hollywood and frequently co-starred with the likewise talented Fred Astaire. Uh, the two were one of the best cinematic couples ever to hit the silver screen. <laughs> Also, Madonna name-checked them in Vogue, or En Vogue. You got the 90s reference there. <laughs> in the end, Cuomo would fast-forward to a future time in pop culture history, and he would settle on two other pop culture legends instead. 50s rock and roll singer-songwriter Buddy Holly, and 60s and 70s TV superstar Mary Tyler Moore. You know it's a lie cause that'll be the day when I die with 
According to the liner notes in Cuomo's Alone Demos collection, the lyrics to Buddy Holly were actually lifted from a real life incident. Apparently some of uh, River's bandmates were teasing his Asian friend and classmate for wearing her hair in a, a retro flip. They were the homies dissing his girl. What's with his homies dissing my girl? Though band tension was something that Rivers rarely wrote about because that would just be awkward. In this case, it was all in good fun. No one was about to front, but it is this uh, comical conflict that serves as the foundation of the song. It's all about defending a friend's honor, and uh, though the lyrics, your tongue is twisted, your eyes are slit, might not go over well with the modern Me Too generation. In the song's context, they are not intended as a slight to anyone. Your tongue is twisted, your eyes are slit. Which is made clear when he sings, don't you ever fear, I'm always near, I know that you need help. Speaking of Buddy Holly, we got to mention our awesome sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. If you want frames that are as stylish as Buddy Holly's, go to zenny.com today. With so much variety, you can design a look that's all you, and then you can add amazing features. Uh, there's blue blocks, anti-fog, anti-glare, all for a price lower than a vinyl record. Go take a look today at zenny.com. So for such a short composition, Buddy Holly really is power packed with a, a lot of quotable lyrics. Ooh, you know and from the woohoos to the OEOs, I mean, come on, there's no way to resist singing along to this song. And that catchy bridge. As if the rest of the song wasn't already way too much fun, this sequence just puts it well over the top. But as much as all the rest of the world fell in love with Buddy Holly, Rivers Cuomo really wasn't all that enthusiastic about this song. And when it came time to, to narrow down the track list, he didn't even want Buddy Holly on the album. Cuomo was concerned that the song you know, sounded too cheesy and you know, that they would be pigeonholed as a novelty. Now, fortunately for planet Earth and its inhabitants, Rick Ocasek disagreed. And over the course of several days, he really campaigned to, to get the track on the album, the final cut. Said Rick, I remember at one point he was hesitant to do Buddy Holly. And I was like, Rivers, we can talk about it. Do it anyway. And if you don't like it when it's done, we won't use it but I think you should try. You did write it, and it's a great song. Matt Sharp remembered that uh, they'd come into the studio each morning and they'd find these little pieces of paper with, with doodles on them saying, we want Buddy Holly. Okasik was ever persistent. In the end, Rivers relented, though he wasn't completely convinced. Buddy Holly did land on the album. The music video for Buddy Holly is one of the best of the 90s. Doubling down on the, the nostalgia factor, the clip features Weezer as the house band at Arnold's drive-in from the 70s, 80s hit show Happy Days. <laughs> Filmmaker Spike Jones, uh, he said of the project, the idea of it being on the set of Happy Days, that came pretty early. My editor and I went through hundreds of episodes when we found the footage of Fonzie dancing. It was like a gold mine. Yeah, anyway, the footage that they found was then, you know, spliced into the band's performance, giving the appearance of Weezer interacting with the show's cast. It's really brilliant. Jones also hired uh, Al Molinero. Uh, to portray his former Happy Days role as the diner's owner. That was really cool. <laughs> Good work, guys. I mean, you were really great. Thanks, Al. When Weezer showed up to shoot, their minds were blown. Brian Bell remembers walking in and knowing right away it was going to be a smash. Seeing the set, all the extras in costume, the whole thing was just surreal. To present Kenosha, Wisconsin's own Weezer. Predictably, Cuomo was less excited. 
thinking the concept was too gimmicky. He said, at once I didn't like it. And at the same time, I knew it was an amazing idea and it had to be done. Resigned to the idea, Rivers geared up in his uh, beige uh, cardigan. And he got to work. Crammed onto a step-up stage barely big enough to fit the quartet. Weezer proceeded to rock uh, 50s, you know, with their 90s jam. But the shoot was almost derailed when Potsy actor uh, Anson Williams refused to let the team use his likeness. He didn't want anything to do with the project. Now, David Geffen even wrote him a letter and tried to change his mind, a very powerful man. But just like in the old days, it was Fonzie that rescued them. It turns out Williams finally relented after he found out Henry Winkler gave the project his blessing. You know, hey, if the Fonz says it's cool, it's cool. Winkler actually said he was grateful to Weezer for their music video since it made him cool in the eyes of his kids. That doesn't happen often. I was happy to do it, he said. The Fonz would have had Weezer on vinyl, <laughs> for sure. I don't care about that. When Buddy Holly hit the MTV rotation, the old school video kicked the band's nostalgia-packed rock ditty into overdrive. And Weezer became a 90s household name from there. We basically owe our career to Spike, admitted Patrick Wilson. One of the more popular videos of its era. I mean, Buddy Holly took home, uh, I think it was four MTV Video Music Awards and two Billboard Music Video Awards back when that mattered. <laughs> the band also benefited from a surprise Microsoft Windows initiative. A packaged on the Fun Stuff CD-ROM that came with Windows 95, Buddy Holly's circulation increased even more dramatically. Happy Days is filmed before a live audience. Ironically, no one in Weezer owned a computer at that time. And at first, they were actually kind of angry that Microsoft didn't consult them. Said Wilson, I was furious because at the time I was like, how are they allowed to do this without our permission? Turns out it was one of the greatest things that could have happened to our band. I mean, can you imagine that happening today? It's like there's one video on YouTube and it's your video. Awesome. Buddy, honey, oh, oh, and you'll With all that headway uh, from the music video, it's surprising that it didn't score a placement on the Billboard Hot 100. This is crazy. Things were crazy in the 90s. Um, can you even believe that? It's nuts. The song did see plenty of other U.S. chart success. It reached number 34 on the mainstream rock chart. That's also a little disappointing. It should have been bigger than that. Number 18 on the Billboard uh, Radio Songs chart. Number 17 on the mainstream top 40. It did go to number two on the alternative airplay, um, the airplay chart. Internationally, it didn't do half bad either. You know, Buddy Holly went to number 31 in the Netherlands, number 19 in Ireland, number 14 in Sweden, 13 in Iceland. Uh, number 12 in the UK, 10 in Scotland, and number 6 in Canada. They got it. Since its 90s heyday, Buddy Holly has appeared in various movies and TV shows. Uh, Comedy Central Rose in 2009, Parks and Recreation in 2014, My Mad Fat Diary in 2014, Limpsing Battle with Finn Wolfhard from Stranger Things, Doing the Honors in 2017, and Love in 2018. Buddy Holly was also covered by Bare Naked Ladies in 95, a double experience in 2016, and Switchfoot as well. Why do they go to front? What did we get? So in the years following Buddy Holly's initial burst onto the scene, Rivers Cuomo remained skeptical of the song and the video's massive success. It's strange that me and my music got caught up in this, is what he said in 97, but our music got to a lot of people as a result of that video. It's my least favorite of all the videos we've done. I think I'd like it more if it weren't me and it weren't my song. I'm extremely grateful to it, but it has nothing to do with me. You could almost see Matt Sharp and Patrick Wilson rolling their eyes. Yeah, I mean, they understood where Cuomo was coming from, but 
The song had helped sell millions of records. Uh, Rivers has a little bit of a complex about that, is what Sharp said. If I were him, I would probably have a complex about that too. I just think we were lucky we made the video and people got to hear all the other songs. Maybe he thinks of it as trickery. But if we made a good record and we're proud of the record, we should get people to hear it." End the quote. Fortunately, in the years since, Rivers Cuomo seems to have made his peace with Buddy Holly in this video. Just to cite one example, on Weezer's 2018 summer tour, audiences were treated with a Buddy Holly music uh, recreation, really. Uh, Re-recreation. <laughs> There at center stage, Rivers Cuomo is dressed in a preppy shirt, tie, and cardigan, just like he wore for the, the original video. The Buddy Holly song and video gets the credit for launching the band's popularity. Weezer is so much more than that one hit single. They've been a rock mainstay for decades, having released 15 studio albums, multiple EPs, and over 40 singles, included among those are seven number one hits on the U.S. Alternative Rock Charts, uh, 13 more top 10 hits. We'll be and Buddy Holly, it's just a fun ride. It makes you feel like you're on top of the world when you listen to it. I mean, what's not to like? It name checks the legend of legends, Buddy Holly, takes you back to a simpler time, and it's catchy as hell. And 94 is a revelation for me and my friends. It was a fresh drink of water as grunge you know, was simmering and a pick-me-up after Kurt Cobain had passed away. It was just fun. And in the times we live in right now, we could all use a little more fun. Tonight? That's not so good, Al. <laughs> not so good, Al. We will definitely cover more from this album. Leave us a comment about Weezer and their Happy Days hit, Buddy Holly. What do you love about this song? Tell us in the comments below. If you enjoyed this episode, check out some of our other 90s rock content. We got the scoop on uh, Stone Temple Pilots, Interstate Love Song, Blind Melons, No Rain, and the Red Hot Chili Peppers Under the Bridge. Tell us what else you'd like to see from the 90s. Uh, if you like this video, take a moment to subscribe below. That way you never miss out on our videos. We'd love to have you as part of our community. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Talk to you soon.